is episode one of the Sifwa game chat. Let the rattle of dice and the Yay! pew pew of virtual lasers <laughs> be off. Um, we're going to be doing it on a regular basis, uh, talking about games. Um, as you may or may not know, Sifwa, the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, recently voted to admit game writers into their hallowed ranks. And so this is part of the celebration. Uh, this will appear on the CIFWA YouTube channel, and you can check it out and see other wonderful things, such as the CIFWA Roundtable, the SpecFic chat, and of course, lots of previews and some live broadcasting from our upcoming Nebula Awards season. Yay! So, my lovely co-host this time is Monica Valentinelli. She's a writer. She's an artist. She's a game developer. She she lurks in the dark. Uh, she writes both <laughs> original and media tie-in fiction and works on games and comics too. She's best known for the making art, Make Art Not War Challenge and working with the Firefly TV show. Uh, as a, what is it? The Firefly RPG books and the Goram Shiniest Language Guide and Dictionary in the Verse for those who want to know more about the lingo used. She's a veteran with over 10 years of gaming experience who's worked on many games, including Dread Names, Red List for Vampire the Masquerade, and In Volo's Wake for Dungeons and Dragons 5e. Yay, D&D &D 5e. That's what I'm playing right now. So. <laughs> so thank you, Monica, for joining us, or joining me, I guess, more accurately. I thought that we I, we would start with kind of talking about what we're playing. So tell me cool. about something that you're playing right now. You mean you want me to tell you about my character? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to be cautious because sometimes those conversations get very, very long. <laughs> but if you had to describe your character in three sentences. With oh, dear. Reasonable um, number of conjunctions and prepositional phrases. So I'm in a D and D fifth edition campaign um, because I'm writing a Ravenloft campaign. Nice. And my D and D fifth edition campaign, I'm playing a half elf folk hero whose name Druid, whose name is Peaches Bramblethorn. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, Peaches, and this is all using the, I, I decided to play it straight. I rolled up her character using the D&D um, player's handbook and went the whole went the whole route and it's yeah. totally random. She's a folk hero who believes she has a destiny and doesn't really want to like sit around arguing about stuff. She just wants to get on with it. So sometimes she um, doesn't make the best choices because she tends to leap first and then ask questions later because she believes that there's this fate waiting for her to be fulfilled. And so far, uh, she's also chosen this. So, um, she's also got some shape-shifting abilities. So she's so far ch turned into a giant uh, wolf spider. As one and, does. Um, she tends to name each form she takes. So that one is Miss Pinchy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. And um, we were facing off against a lot of goblins last time. So she decided to change into a copper, copper dragon wormling, uh, which is long speak for baby dragon and just used acid breath on everybody and, you know, kind of blew them back a bit. Um, and that one was uh, Baby Puffy. Baby Puffy, I love <laughs> this. Are this a, is this a live game? So are you fun. playing online or? Uh, no, we're not playing online. We're playing. We're actually human beings sitting around oh a table, really nice. But, oh, um, cool. but my claim to fame when I play games is that I am notorious for rolling really badly. So, I have a coffin set up where I have to like <laughs> conduct funerals for my dice so that. <laughs> You know, I get I get advice from people. Sometimes they want me to perform an exorcism. Sometimes they think I should buy new dice. Um, this time I rolled giant foam dice, and that seems to work a little. <laughs> so just you're trying the different rituals. You're you're. That's right. That's right. It's all about those little finer moments. <laughs> it really, it really is. And so, what does your party think of of their part in? Uh, uh, Peach's Bramblethorn's destiny. Do they feel they're part of it? Do they buy into this? Um, right now, I believe 
that's kind of hard to say because <laughs> because uh, when we figured out the goblins were coming and this really nasty witch whose apprentice had you know almost decimated us using ice bolts, when we found out she was coming, they wanted to you know go after the villainous and like try to do all this stuff. I'm like, no, no, no. We have to save the people first because that's important. So, <laughs> you know, she's um, she's kind of a goofball. And because of that is adding a little bit of, you know, people are like, well, we want to kill the monster and get the XP ah! and take the treasure. And I'm like, let's go save the peoples. <laughs> it's just Bramblethorn, a woman of the people. It's just Bramblethorn, a woman of the people. Oh, that's so awesome. Well, so oh. what are you playing? I am actually, right now I'm playing in this, uh, unfortunately, overly sporadic game on Twitch, which is, it's a campaign of Esper Genesis, which is basically hmm. D&D 5e in space. Ooh. And it is That's super cool. cool. It has taken us three separate sessions to basically get from our point of origin out to our spaceship. We had our first space battle uh, last time. It's actually got like its ship own. to ship? Yes, it's got its own cool, cool rules. And and so like you're basically uh they've got it set up so each person is playing a specific role and you have a choice of I think it's like five or six different strategies that you can pick and pick from. But then you've got to kind of work together because like what I decide to do as technician might affect the next gunner's role if I pick mm. something that's gonna add a plus to their uh targeting or something like that. So you really got to coordinate stuff and kind of think it out ahead of time. So yeah, it was super cool. So. Yeah, I I love battle tactics um, because I come from a very big narrative background. So mm -hmm. whenever I play um, any sort of games where it's like, you know, it's groups of us fighting something, I really like to be able to play to one another's strengths and weaknesses because yeah. I just yeah. feel like it just makes the game more fun. Yeah. You know, because we yeah. each kind of shine for those reasons. Oh, and I think, so. well, it's one of those things that really makes gaming, it makes it become a teamwork, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just kind of each of you trying to impose your particular version of the narrative on each other, right? And whoever's kind of the best <laughs> shouting, right? <wins. laughs> but everybody's yeah. riffing off each other. Everybody's playing off each other. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's a lot of cooperative games out there. Like Pandemic is a really good one where um, you are a, each one of you has a role, a sci very scientific or emergency based role. And you're basically racing against this disease outbreaks that are happening all over the world. And it's so much fun to introduce people to that because a lot of people stereotype gaming as being this very individualistic thing where you know this person is just trying to get the most points or the most right. treasure or whatever right. and it really doesn't have to be um yeah. there's a lot of different types of playing styles and you know sometimes the fun is just finding out which one is right for you yeah yeah, yeah for sure <laughs> well yeah. and there was much rejoicing and there was much rejoicing <laughs> but rather than just kind of i, I have a feeling we could probably spend like 45 60 minutes just talking about characters so oh I'm my god yes avoid <laughs> that um tell me what you're working on right now that's game related um crap <laughs> i told I, you the question was coming i know the question was coming <laughs> and then i had to shift gears and all of a sudden my brain went mm -hmm. er, 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 er. Not going to happen. Um, I am the developer for a game called Hunter the Vigil, mm -hmm. and I am finishing up um, my portion of the work on the second edition. In Hunter the Vigil, you get to play a monster hunter, and your group of people long term commit to this hunt. And it's all about both the emotional sacrifices and physical sacrifices that you make, but also some really cool bits because I'm bringing back some uh, contemporary urban legends. Ooh. So, um, you know, the, the monster in your backyard, like um, in Wisconsin, there's this, the Wolf of Bray Road, for example, you could definitely seek down to um, hunt that and fight it. And the great thing I really like about Hunter is that you don't always know what the monster is. Nice. So something that could be 
something that could act like a vampire could actually be a ghost or something that could act like a werewolf could actually just be a rabid dog or, you know, in, you know what I mean? Not, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because of the bestiality nature of it. So it's it's not always clear what you know as a human being with a short lifespan who's finding your way into all of this stuff. And I feel that that is very entrenched in um, our psyche. You know, you look at the length of seasons that we've had for Supernatural, for example. Um, it's, it's just something that I think is going to appeal to a lot of different people. And I'm really excited about it. That's awesome. And I, I thought yeah. about Supernatural because I'm in the middle of working my way through a massive rewatch. Uh, mm. I'm currently on season seven and just <laughs> being <laughs> onward and onward and onward. Um, but that's really fun stuff, I think, because it's so sort of it is far away and yet immediate, right? It's a sort mm -hmm. of thing where you can be walking down the street to the pizza parlor late at night and kind of be like, well, what if a werewolf were lurking in the shadows, right? Yeah, and you can make it more personal too, which is which is one of the angles that I'm kind of going for because I feel that, um, I feel that horror has changed both as a genre and the way that our personal fears have changed. And I feel that, um, you know, Hunter can definitely have that aspect to it where the stakes are higher and that personal feel is there. Mm -hmm. um, so there are going to be some in-game related things to that. One of the things that we're bringing in is the idea that um, not only do these monsters exist, but sometimes they have lairs. <laughs> sometimes you could find the places right. where they live. And we're going to kind of shape how those work in the game. Or even, you know, you could be on a train and think that there's a ghost on a train, but it's really not. It's the train that's haunted. Ooh. So the entire train is a ghost train. Um, you know, so, so playing around a little bit, not only with misdirection, mm -hmm. but also tapping into the environment a little bit more to really ground it and make it personal and make it feel a little bit more real and... Mm -hmm back of your neck spine tingling stuff, mm -hmm. which I think is what the game is really good at doing. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, cool. thanks. Cool. Um, yeah, that's, I, I think one of the things that increasingly people want to think about often when you're designing games, and particularly role-playing games, is how do you make them so immersive? How do you make them so vivid for the player that the, you know that the hairs are you're kind of standing up on the mm -hmm. back of your neck. You know how do you go about uh, you know, just just really really engaging someone in the way that really really good games do? Do you have particular strategies that you're uh, using for that? Um, the way that I look at tabletop games in particular is that. Um, for role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons, and um, I'm also working on a Chronicle, I'm one of the developers on a Chronicles of Darkness supplement called Dark Eras 2, which ties into alternate history for all our different game lines. So um, developing something inspired by Galileo Galilei um, during that time period and a whole bunch of other things. So it's, it, it's both theme and mood happen kind of at the table. But the way that I think of role-playing games in general is that what I am providing is the potential for storytelling. Mm -hmm. So all of the tools that I'm providing are things that you as the player or the GM can then pick and choose. Um, I like the toolkit approach or the toolkit mentality mm -hmm. to customize to your needs because the way that you might respond to a really compelling moment is different than how I might respond to a compelling moment because everybody's, you know, everybody's, um, uh, what's the word, uh, threshold for mm -hmm. what their emotional investment in is different, but also how they react to their character, how they react to horror at the table and in a story is also different. Mm -hmm. So my job is to provide as many tools as possible and also a lot of different inspirations, both through the text and uh, through the rules because the rules will accompany that experience. Um, I also employ a writing style that employs heavy word conservation, mm -hmm. where I try to say as much as I possibly can in as few words as possible, which is totally different than the way I talk. So, <laughs> because when I have a text manuscript, I can edit it. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. But when I'm speaking, I can't edit while I'm talking. So, well, I mean, you know, I just try to jam it all in there as much as possible. 
No, but, but nobody talks the way like you see it on the page, right? Everybody's right. got these sentences that just like blah, 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 and, 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 and sounds. <laughs> yes, I would love to, but <laughs> well, actually, I, I I'm gonna take that back because I did meet one human being who spoke in complete paragraphs, and wow. that was when I was at Hopkins and studying with John Barth. Oh, and really? He did speak in complete, coherent, <laughs> convincing, beautiful paragraphs. That's awesome. That's amazing. I have nobody else though. All right. So we're getting to the most important part of the program where we are going to discuss how we would have cast, not how, how we would have done Infinity Wars differently and what heroes we would have used. Monica has a couple of strong <laughs> contenders. I'm going to mention uh, one of the characters that I've there's she, she's coming on the the what is it the television program but like Hellcat mm -hmm. do you remember happy the happy go lucky Hellcat particularly in her Defenders run when she hooked up with Son of Satan and there was all those kind of like there was like Ugh. it was like super weird shit going on but I would put in Hellcat and uh, I would put in She Hulk and I would oh put yeah in absolutely oh. And I would have, and I think this is valid because she was in a Marvel team up with Spider Man at one point, Red Sonia. Mm, interesting. Red Sonia would, would kick ass. So, and now. So, so, are we doing full Marvel then? Or can I like expand and blow your mind a little bit? Oh, you can, you can blow my mind. Okay, because I totally love costumes. <laughs> Anytime we go mind blowing, I have to go Swamp Thing because Swamp Thing is just, if Swamp Thing is possible, Swamp Thing has to be there. Mm. So, I'm mm -hmm. doing the tendrils. This is the swamp thing tendrils. The swamp right. thing tendrils. All right, yeah, so that would be super cool. Um, I have to go with Lady Deadpool. <laughs> I think that would be amazing. I think that would be amazing too. We don't see a lot of really smart ass, kick ass women. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I would love to see a female character that does that. Like, um, Lady Deadpool is one. Tank Girl would be another one. Uh, oh, um, Tank Girl. <laughs> Take girl is awesome. Oh, you know that that kind of wise cracking oh, character um, that does that. Well, wasp depending upon how she's written. Uh, yeah, how she's written. Yeah, because she has to be. It depends upon how she's written because she's been depicted so many different ways. But, um, cool. but yeah, because I think of that and it's like I I would really like to see a larger depth and breadth of character. Mm -hmm. Um, personality types and I feel like we've explored kind of the gamut of the wealthy dude with the mysterious yeah. past <laughs> well it just it there's I, I'm not I'm not spoiling this I mean I, I don't think there's a spoiler but like Stephen Strange and Tony Stark in the movie bounce off each other and it's clearly like you know sort of rich douchebag moment right and they're just like nah, nah, nah. And, and, and it's <laughs> You know, and it's just, and you think, it makes you think, you're like, oh gosh, yes, this is such a stereotyping. Like if you threw Bruce Wayne into the mix, it would just oh. be totally insufferable. Um, See, my my horror team would be <laughs> Bruce Wayne, uh, Doctor Strange, Iron Man, Iron Fist. Iron Fist. I mean, because there's so many characters with yeah. that, you know, yeah. I'm a wealthy dude who had to abandon all this stuff in order to take up this mantle. I'm gonna fade now into my emotional. That's it. That's it. Um, I, am, I am so so broken and yet so so wealthy. Though I will, though I will say that I am totally Team Batman for lots of reasons. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, but it's it. I feel like that character has been done so many times before, and they have so much potential to go over here. Like She Hulk, for example, that could be a great character to do a standalone movie on. They don't need to do an origin because everybody knows what the Hulk is. Yeah. You oh, can seriously can handle her origin story in like five minutes, seriously. And then just kind of go on in that dichotomy of being a lawyer and then oh, and then having to do all these other sorts of things. I mean, and then all of the stereotypes that come with being that, you know, that's such a strong commentary. Strong commentary, get it? Uh, <laughs> my jokes are very subtle. Um, <laughs> That, that's such a powerful commentary yeah. for what we have, you know, going on today, that there could be a lot of really good exploration for that. And 
I don't know, that type of storytelling really excites me. I think that would so, be a blast. Yeah, that would be a super huge blast. But yes, Tank Girl, Lady Deadpool. I'm just thinking of, of Law and Order with the She-Hulk in there and like mm -hmm. some sort of like superhero insurance litigation. Suit oh my gosh. Like that, it'd just be like wrongful property damage, right? Something where, where just like the idea of the superhero and the idea of like kind of the corporate capitalist machine just thoroughly butt up against each other. I think it'd be awesome. Yeah, that would be super cool. And and you know, the, the crime angle is so universal that you could literally use that as your introduction to female superhero mm -hmm. characters in yeah. general. So, okay. you know, she could be doing her thing and all of a sudden, you know, you have these little cameo appearances as Easter eggs, which would be so cool. I don't know. I'm like, oh God, it's like dream, you know, it, it, it's like one of those dreams where I just wish we could have a superhero, superheroine movie, excuse me, that didn't suck. Yeah, it would be. Well, I mean, I, and I think we're getting there. We're getting I think there. we're getting there. I'm really excited for, you know, they announced Black Widow, but also Captain Marvel. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. I think we're going to get there. I'm excited about Captain Marvel. She's always been a favorite of mine. So, okay. Well, uh, we have been going for approximately <laughs> 22 minutes and we have managed, I think, not to be too contentious or too many pretentious or any sort of ush. Monica, so so any, we kind of rolled ahead. the dice and we just kind of hit average is what you're saying. No, we hit charming and delightful and kind of vaguely entertaining in a charmingly informal sort of way. I'll go with vaguely entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, people who want to check out Monica's work, go to booksofm.com. Monica, where are you next? I know you're cutting back on convention appearances. Are you appearing anytime in like the next few months that people should be aware of? Uh, yes. <laughs> so I am going to MoCon in um, Indiana this weekend. Oh. And then I am going to the Nebula Awards for Yay. the first time for the weekend. Yay! It'll be my first time and I'll be very much deer in headlights and probably open mouth and third foot. But that's okay because that's what I do. Um, <laughs> and then I'm going to Wisconsin where um, I think we're going to have a lot of really powerful discussions. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Yeah. Awesome. The Nebulas, the Nebulas will be amazing. And, and I really, they, they are. I'm looking forward to it. Fun. Yeah. I have a uh, tiara this year. Uh, I bought this fancy dress and a friend of my friend, Chris Dykeman is making this amazing uh, tiara. And then another friend is making a wonderful trident. Mm. Uh, so it's very exciting. That is People very exciting. You'll witness this. All right. So I must sign off. Thank you for joining us, yeah. Monica. Thank you for joining me. And thank you, viewers. Uh, please come back. We'll have another Sifwa game chat soon, I hope. Talk Yay. to you. Bye. Roll the wild. Bye.